The content you're about to enjoy comes from the archives of The Best You. We're devoted to the very best in personal development, with a platform and resources dedicated to inspiring and changing people's lives. At The Best You, we work with the world's leading writers and trainers on the evolution of the self and people whose journeys have been affected by their work and words. For more information, go to www.thebestyou.co. So Dr. Richard Bandler is the co-developer of NLP, also known as Neuro Linguistic Programming. He conducts NLP seminars, NLP workshops, and NLP training seminars internationally. He personally runs the licensed practitioner and master practitioner in London and in Florida. He's also created some amazing seminars and workshops around neurohypnotic repatterning, design, human engineering, persuasion engineering, personal enhancement, charisma enhancement, and so many more. He's written many books, more than 35 books, and they've been translated into many languages. He is one of the biggest influencers in the personal development world, without a doubt. He has helped millions of people. He has hundreds of institutes which are teaching people NLP. NLP is being used in many great ways. It's been used in schools and colleges. It's been used in universities. Uh, Psychologists use NLP. People use it in business. They use it to find love, to lose weight, you name it. So my work with him, I've worked with Dr. Richard Bandler for the last 10 years. I did my licensed practitioner in 1996, but since for the last 10 years, I've been promoting Richard in London through NLP Life Training. And uh, it's been an absolute amazing pleasure. We trained over 25,000 people. So to work and see Richard's work like I have for the last 10 years has been an amazing journey and opportunity for me. The reason I wanted to interview him is because, you know, when Richard runs these seminars, he doesn't really have the chance to speak and, you know, talk a little bit more detail about himself. So I, this was a very special interview for me. I really enjoyed it and I hope you enjoy it too. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Bernardo Moya from The Best You. And welcome to Inspiring People. Today I'm here with Richard Bandler, um, one of my favourite geniuses in the world, and um, the co-creator of NLP. Hi Richard, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, Bernardo. Thank you very much uh, for being here today. Um, Tell me a little bit about yourself. Where were you born? Where were you brought up? Well, I was born in uh, Teaneck, New Jersey. I lived on the Hackensack River for the first five years of my life. And in that time in the United States, they didn't believe you could pollute things. And where I lived was a demonstration of the fact that wasn't true. Uh, Moved to California when I was young and pretty much moved all over the place. Uh, My parents couldn't decide where they wanted to live. And when they split up, I went with my mother and we lived all over the place, Uh, mostly near San Francisco or in San Francisco. But, uh, you know, I was always the new kid in town. And so I was used to change, and it seems like I've gotten quite good at it over the years. <laughs> How old were you when, you, when you, your parents split up? Uh, I think seven, seven, something like that. I don't know. Wasn't really keeping track at the time. Mm. You know, they didn't do it in an instant. They did it slowly. They sta- stayed apart and got together and stayed apart and got together. It was a little tumultuous. Um, my mother is a very good-humored person. My father was pretty cranky, mm. and I, they just didn't. Finally, they got sick of each other, and you know, and rightfully so, I would imagine. Um, my mother's now eighty-four and still complains about it from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> and how were your early years at school? Well, at, at school, you know, it's funny when you're constantly going into a new school. You know, you have a lot of adjusting to do. And uh, in those days, education wasn't quite as uniform as it is now. But I think like most people, I had a few teachers that were just outstanding and motivated me to learn. And typically, they were the ones that were fun. And then most of the time, it was tedious, boring. And you felt a little bit like you were in jail, you know, during the day, staring at the clock, waiting to go out and have a life. And it's a shame that a lot of school is like that. But a lot of people don't associate learning with fun. 
But I do remember when I was in the sixth grade, I had a, a, a wonderful teacher. And at first I was terrified because I'd never really been around uh, uh, Japanese people before. And all I'd ever seen was Japanese war movies. And, uh, and they, they had a new Japanese teacher at the school. And it turned out he was an airplane engineer at Lockheed who had retired and just, just quit and decided to, to become a school teacher. And he taught us everything. Like when he taught us math, he taught us the equations to design airplanes. And we designed little jets that were about this big with eye hooks and CO2s in them and taught us how to compute distance and time to know what speed was. And uh, everything he did, he turned into something dramatic and fun. You know, that uh, instead of just reading, you know, some boring book, he would have us act it out. And it was always one thing after another. And it, he always stuck in my mind as being a great teacher. I, even, I could barely tell you the names of most of my teachers in school, but his name was Mr. Lang. I've never forgotten it. Mm. Uh, you know, he really taught me a lesson that when people are enjoying themselves, they'll really put out and learn. And then the next year I had a teacher which demonstrated to me that if a teacher is boring enough, you can't even remember their name or anything else about them. <laughs> um, did you stand out in, in any particular subjects? I don't think I really stood out. I was not terribly social when I was young. I was pretty quiet and tried to avoid getting beat up like most people in the neighborhoods. I mean, uh, I have to admit, most of California in the schools, they were, they were like war zones, a lot of them. And I don't think you wanted to stand out, you know. There were big guys that stood out, and, you know, I tried to avoid as much difficulty as possible. Uh, at, somewhere in junior high school, I discovered I had a real knack for math. I, you know, it was just one of those things that the more they threw at me, the more I could take. And when they started, you know, they, they normally you had one teacher all day long. And when you get to middle school in the U.S., then you start learning math from one person and English from one person and art from one person. And uh, I, in the seventh grade, I had a really good math. We actually knew math. He was somebody that enjoyed it. And at, years later in high school, I had math teachers who named were coach. But once I understood that I was good at it, I always applied myself. I just I was good with numbers and good with equations. They made sense to me. And uh, I, I was never very good at, at reading, and I've never had good handwriting. I've been criticized for penmanship my entire life. And they always told me, if you have bad handwriting, no one will think you're intelligent. I think that turned out to be wrong. <laughs> um, or you should have been a doctor. Yeah, <laughs> except I wouldn't trust me with a scalpel. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then what, what was next? After, after college, um, what did you decide to do? After college? Mm. Uh, well, when I was actually in college, uh, that, was, that was the time when, because I got interested in symbolic logic and from symbolic logic and computer programming and information science in college. And when I transferred from one college to another, their information and science department sank. It was a new building in University of California, and the entire applied science building was built over caves and began sinking. So they literally didn't bring in the professors, didn't bring in the teachers, and, and I was bored beyond comprehension. So and I was taking classes in social sciences and linguistics and things I knew nothing about nor really cared much about. But uh, I was living in a house owned by a psychiatrist, and uh, I had given his son music lessons because I would played a lot of music when I was young. And his uh, son was awkward, and they felt if he played an instrument, it would help him through his awkwardness. Only a psychiatrist would think about things that way. And uh, I don't think he really wanted to be a musician. He just did it, I think, mostly because he liked me. The hour he hung out with me, people weren't pressuring him to do things. And when I moved in this house, there were all these books that I probably would have never read. And uh, I do read pretty fast, and I started pouring through all these psychology books and psychiatry books, uh, books that the guy had gotten in college, I guess, and uh, books that people send to you when you're a psychiatrist. And I, one of the things that I noticed was that none of them told you what you're supposed to do. 
uh, and uh, it was just one thing after another. And he was very involved in uh, the the new psychology, the psychotherapy movements. He knew almost every famous psychotherapist personally, and had published some of their books. and And he was a really nice guy. And the, you know, and when I started asking questions, like, well, you know, this, there's all this stuff that tells you that, like this. I said, what do you do for these people? And he would go, listen to them. And I'd go. Yeah, and then what? You know, and he goes and then listen some more. And, uh, you know, he was trained as, because psychiatrists are trained as medical doctors and trained to think that things are like medical problems. And they therefore try to diagnose people. And so, uh, even in the new psychotherapies, you know, it was your problem was that you had low self esteem or your problem was that you are schizophrenic. It was all identify what's wrong with you and then try to figure out where it came from. And so they were like archaeological digs in your childhood. Now, some of the the more advanced psychotherapies, and, and I remember because I read a book by Fritz Perls, and uh, when I read the book by Fritz Perls, I, I thought it was one of the funniest things I'd ever read in my life. He had people identifying with dreams and going, that woman, I'd dream I went into a diner with my mother and she drank a strawberry milkshake and I drank a chocolate milkshake. And he'd go, okay, you are the chocolate milkshake. And people would act these things out. And I'm not sure what this was actually supposed to do, but uh, I just found it hysterical to the point where I was laughing so hard I had tears in my eyes. And I remember him coming in the house and seeing me and coming in and putting his arms around me and telling me, oh, everything's going to be okay. <laughs> and, and I'm pointing at the book, and he goes, oh, yes, he's a brilliant person. And then two months later, I'm down in Esalen, California, meeting the guy. If you're interested in working with me, contributing to the magazine, maybe speaking at any of our many events around the world, partnering or licensing the best you, Go to www.thebestyou.co. When you modelled Milton, uh, it was you and John Grinder. Um, tell me, uh, because from what I gather, it's you were just curious. Obviously, you did all this research and you came up with your own, you know, um, uh, system where you thought, look, that there's more to it. What, what, um, how did you come across? How did the word neuro linguistic programming? How, how did that happen? <laughs> Well, actually, uh, that it, that was just because I got pulled over by a highway patrolman, and I had a whole lot of books on the floor of my car, and he looked at me and said, what do you do for a living? And I took the beginning of three different books. One was a neurology book, one was John Grinder's linguistic book, and the other was a programming manual, manual for a PDP 1134A. And I went, I'm a neuro-linguistic programmer. And when I looked back at him, he was totally impressed. He went, God, that sounds really sophisticated. <laughs> and I looked at him and I went, yeah, yeah. And uh, I got out of a ticket. <laughs> How did people take you, Richard? Because, I, I mean, I've seen photographs of you when you were younger, but, you know, mid-20 guys, obviously very knowledgeable, very cocky. How, how did they take you? Who is this guy they must have thought? Well, there was a lot of people that that I have to that that were taken aback by the fact that I was trying to do something that would work, and that I would blatantly go. You know, when I went in a mental hospital, typically I was brought by psychiatrists who who had a patient who was hospitalized. The people at the hospital didn't want me to do things, but I'd go to the family. You know, you know, I'd bring a drooling Jewish lawyer, if that's what it took, to try something other, because families were always telling me that the patients were getting worse. They go, I go to visit my brother, he's worse than he was a month ago, and I'm afraid if he stays there forever, he's never going to get out. And I remember going to the mental hospital, and they actually had chronic wards. Chronic means permanent, you know, long and enduring suffering. And, you know, chronic pain means it's not going to, it's not like, you know, cutting your finger with a piece of paper that it's going to go over there. I don't call that a chronic paper cut. Uh, and, you know, and literally at one hospital, it was chiseled in stone outside the building, chronic ward. And when I looked at that, I went, this is wrong. It just was wrong. And especially then, mental hospitals were very ugly, hideous places. And, you know, uh, you know, and even though it was 1970, they were electrocuting people to try and get them to change their behavior. And there are people who will defend electric shock treatment to the end of time because they got more change by electrocuting people than anything else. But excuse me, it still seems extreme. 
Most of the patients in these mental hospitals were overly medicated, and they even called it the Thorazine shuffles. And later on, when they put them on a better drug, halothene, they were still shuffling around. And uh, the more I looked at that, the more I wanted to know for sure that you could do something to make contact with people. If they were delusional and thought they were Jesus Christ, then I wanted to see them on Good Friday. And I would bring crucifixes and carpentry tools and stare them in the eye until they were really convinced that they wanted to tell me <coughs> they were Melvin Schwartz. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those classic things that, you know, people write about me doing and that I have in some of my books where I did outrageous things, those were mostly to prove it to me that there was a better way. So and over the years, we've slowly built a technology, and it's a large technology. And I know in the group I'm doing here, this woman came up to me today on the stage, and she said, ah, I, I'm a psychologist. Like, that, like the fact that I make fun of psychologists means it's bad. And, and I said, and I'm the person that's trying to provide this field of psychology, the field of education. In fact, I have things for the field of architecture. I have all kinds of learning programs. I've developed learning programs for the military. That anywhere people are in a position where they can get smarter at what they do, even baseball. I've tried really good baseball players and designed baseball programs for people to learn to be better baseball players. Once I understood that there was a mental process that worked, you don't study depressives to find out about depression. Because unless you want to depress other people, they haven't got any information. You study happy people and find out what happy people are doing and teach the depressives to do it. You teach the people that don't know which things are fantasies to have a different way inside their mind of knowing what they fantasized versus what really happened. And they'll start to sort it out. And sometimes it's real basic. I, I had somebody hallucinating wild, floridly things. I mean, stuff that nobody else saw. And, you know, let's face it, there's a lot of ideas that people share in common, which I don't. You know, there are a lot of people that believe in that I don't. You know, there are people that tell me that there are conspiracies going on and there'll be 50 people in a room all agreeing that, you know, there are gigantic conspiracies going on, that the United States government could keep a secret well enough to keep the secret that they'd had contact with aliens. I'm afraid the people in the White House can't even keep secret what they're doing yesterday. Uh, you know, I just don't see this as, you know, something I agree with. But we don't lock those people up. We don't lock up people because they have a religious belief. Uh, not in America, not in England. We go, if you want to believe that, go ahead and believe it. And But if you have one, if one person believes things like that, you know, there's an angel in their closet, and their parents go and say there's no angel in the closet, they'll end up thinking they're crazy. Me, I check the closet first. It's the first place I do. Because I had a little girl that they thought was uh, mentally having problems, and she kept saying she talked to an angel in the closet. And when I went over her house with her psychiatrist, I looked down to her, and I said, I do have a question about your angel in the closet. And she said, what? And I said, which closet? And she goes, that one over there in the hallway. I said, okay, show me. And she went over, and there was a little doll, a little angel doll, and he pulled a string and it talked. She had been in therapy already for eight months, and nobody looked in the closet. And see, to me, when, when somebody tells me there's a, a, an imbalance in somebody's system and that the reason a depressive has a mental imbalance, I want blood tests. I want to see what's out of whack. Because, you know, I've had people that hallucinated because their potassium is too low. And whether it's, you know, that they need to eat more bananas or they need vitamins or, or they need to have black lines around their fantasies, I'm not picky. I just want ways that people can do things better. If you're interested in watching the video content of this interview and many others, or interested in learning from world leaders and teachers, go to www.thebestyou.online. What would you say your best assets are, Richard? You've obviously got a few, but what are your best? My best asset is my wife. <laughs> <laughs> nice touch. <laughs> no, it, uh, I've always had, I, I think it's that I believe that people can, you know, that no matter how much they feel hopeless, uh, I don't really believe them. I believe that they think something different and do something. And I, I think that when you fail, it's because you stop trying. And when you stop trying, then it's real easy to make yourself feel worse and not do anything or to give up on patience. To See, if 
if somebody, if, if you blame the fact a patient isn't changing on themselves rather than on the technology you have, no one would ever do research. Doctors don't go, well, these people are dying on cancer and, and the, what we have now should be enough. They should get cured, darn them. They keep doing research to find a better way to do it. Now, unfortunately, they're not all working together in a way which I think produces as good a result as it could. And, and a lot of people, you know, look at something, you know, it's like if you have a rare disease, you're more li less likely that they'll ever find a cure because there's no money in it. And uh, there are a lot of things where, where I think we're not aiming our resources at finding out about things where, like, you know, the cases of spontaneous remission. I think if we really went through it, we'd find out it wasn't nearly as spontaneous as we think it is. They might have done something to change their diet. Who knows? But that if we really began to examine things, both the physical health, but especially in mental health, there are times where people change and events happen in their life and they change beliefs profoundly. So learning to change your own beliefs so that you're more propelled and have more motivation to do things, I think is better. It's just a better choice. And my greatest asset is that I'm always willing to take a shot at it. And, uh, and, and it, it, to me, when I had these group of people that sent me clients, and many of them were psychiatrists, and it, I think part of it that was they sent me to clients because they were frustrated that they didn't know what to do. They couldn't offer them help. So rather than just refer them away or hospitalize them, they'd bring them in and I'd, they'd come with them. And, and when I started doing things, because I didn't know how to do what they did, plus everything in the file was a list of what not to do, and started trying other things by getting them to supply me information and the shrink as well, and sometimes calling people on the phone that I knew that knew how to do something and teaching them, when, and especially when you use hypnosis, it's a very powerful amplifier. And where, you know, they actually said in most old psychiatric books that you couldn't hypnotize schizophrenics. Well, actually, that's not true. You can't hypnotize them unless you can get their attention. And I'm very good at getting people's attention because I, I don't put up with a bunch of nonsense from my clients. Whereas psychiatrists have to be warm and empathetic. I can be terrifying. <laughs> and <We> uh, <laughs> Yes, you all know. And I'll do whatever it takes to get them to pay attention long enough to go into enough of an altered state to be able to, to believe and to do different things. Milton did it to get him out of the hospital and get a job. I do it so that they'll get on the highway to having a better life. They have to figure out what will make them happy. But at least if they're trying to figure out what will make them happy, because most people are confused about the difference between remembering. They think they're thinking, but they're actually remembering what makes them feel bad, so they feel bad, so they don't do. Whereas when you think, you change how your mind is structured in some way so that you begin to open up horizons and try new things. If you could give yourself any advice... Give myself advice? Yep. Well, I give myself advice all the time. I don't always follow it. <laughs> if you could give yourself any advice for when a younger version of you, what, what would it be? A younger version of me? Yeah. It's no matter what they tell you, just go ahead and do it. Mm. That uh, you don't know till you try. And if you try and it doesn't work, that just means you need to try another way. Uh, to me, I, it, if, if I had stopped trying stuff, I would have never found anything out. You know, I kept asking other people. I kept asking more detailed questions. Because if something wasn't happening, I, I knew it had to do with the way I was approaching it. Even as a scientist, the same model that we developed to, to figure out, to help people, the meta model, I started applying with physicists. So when they told me that it was impossible to do certain things within, in the field of holography, uh, that, you know, my physicists would say, well, this can't be done because. And I would say, well, what would happen if you did do it? And when you pose the question differently, they go, well, then you would have to have film that was like this, and there's no such thing as read-write film. And then somebody else goes, well, actually, Plessy made read-write film. Uh, nobody ever used it for anything, but I know a guy at Livermore that could get some. And the next thing you know, the hole is opened up. That is, if your theory tells you something is impossible and you don't look beyond it, you don't get that thing, not what stops me, but what would happen if I did. Then you get to go into the future and look backwards and start to see what needs to be created, what needs to be asked, what needs to be done, what you need to try in order to get to the other side. 
And, you know, there are obstacles in life. And when the obstacles get there, that means you need to try something else and you need to become more determined. Uh, people, you know, don't create big companies without tremendous tenacity. And it, it doesn't surprise me when you tell me somebody like Richard Branson swims around his island in circles, uh, you know, just to know that he can, is because he's a very determined guy. He's done tremendously well at everything he's started. That doesn't mean it was easy. It doesn't mean that people didn't tell him he couldn't. Oh, you can't start your own record company. You can't start your own airline. You can't this. But most of the really successful people who have achieved a lot in life, when they hear that kind of stuff, something inside them goes, oh, yeah? Well, watch this. And young people need to have more of that. that they, they can't just expect to pop out of college, have somebody give them a job, and it lasts their whole life. There was a time in history where mm. that pretty much happened. Mm. It's a different world now. Yeah. Well, it's a different world for better or for worse. Mm. It's the one we've got. Mm. And people better learn to adapt to what is. Otherwise, things are not going to work out so well. You know, there are people that had jobs most of their lives and suddenly became unemployed. And, you know, they had expected. They made deals with these companies. You know, I'm going to stay there. I'm going to retire. You're going to support me for the rest of my life. And when it didn't work out, you know, and the companies went bankrupt and disappeared, they may be angry and they may know who to blame. But they're not, things aren't going to get better till they adapt somehow. And you better plan to adapt ahead of time. Better, <laughs> better you get ahead of the curve than let it smack you in the head. <laughs> My last question, Richard. What would you like your legacy to be? not quite sure what that word means, to tell you the truth. I don't think I have any control over what my legacy will be other than... Legacy's there already. (laughs) Yeah, it's already way outside of my control. Um, I want to make sure that a lot of good training goes down so that a lot of what I've done doesn't get lost. Uh, I've written a lot of books and... uh, over the years, I've made loads of tapes, and I'm sure people will look back at it, and I'm sure 100 years from now, they'll look at this, you know, the same way I look back at what Freud did. They'll go, God, he didn't know anything, and that will be a good thing. But in the meanwhile, there's going to be a lot of businesses, a lot of schools, a lot of people that do better than they would have. And I think that's what my legacy is, and I don't think I could stop it if I wanted to. No. Thank you very much, Richard. That You've bet. Thank you. And thank you for watching Inspiring People. For more information, go to www.thebestyou.co.